Welcome to the National Headache Foundation's Anxiety and Headache Webinar. This evening we are joined by Dr. Stephen Baskin of the New England Center for Headache in Stamford, Connecticut. Dr. Baskin, thank you for joining us. Nice to be here. Today I am going to speak on headache and anxiety. And I'm going to give a short presentation. Um, it starts out with a little cartoon that seems a little bit funny where it says it only hurts when I exist. But in reality, we have a combination of uncomfortable situations where you have a headache disorder and an anxiety disorder. That combination can be very difficult, as some of you are well aware. Psychiatric comorbidity means that there's that a headache disorder and a psychiatric disorder may coexist. It doesn't mean that the headache disorder is caused by the psychiatric disorder or the psych problem is caused by the headache problem. But when people have both, it can complicate the diagnosis of, of either of them. So sometimes if you see, if you present to a psychiatrist or you present to, you know, somebody that the major problem is the psych issue, people don't realize that headache is also a problem. And sometimes if you, if you present to a neurologist or another headache specialist, they don't ask much about the, the psychiatric issues. So people with both, let's say, migraine and an anxiety disorder sometimes are not very adherent with treatment, meaning that it's harder to follow treatment regimen for headache and a treatment regimen for anxiety if you have an anxiety disorder. And sometimes some of the treatments increase anxiety and hence adherence to treatment isn't that great. Sometimes people don't tolerate drugs very well with headache and anxiety. And some people have a difficult response, that they have a poorer response to drug and non-drug treatments, although that's questionable, and I'll talk about some recent studies that have changed that point of view. And it may increase the risk of relapse. If you start to improve, you might not remain improved. And very importantly, anxiety with headache may chronify the course of migraine, meaning that you start to get more and more headaches um, if you have migraine with a comorbid anxiety problem. So if you look at prognosis, so if you, this is an interesting study that was done years ago in Italy by Vincenzo Guidetti, but it's, it's very relevant and he's updated some of this data recently. But I like the original where what you see towards the bottom, if, if somebody has refractory headache, a young person with really very, very high frequency headache that has not responded well to treatment as an adolescent. If there's no psych disorder, most of those patients are improved their headache free eight years later. You see, if there's only one psych disorder, for example, depression or anxiety, many of them are improved and only about 15% are, are the same or, or worse eight years later. However, if they have multiple disorders, it can become much more of a problem. And you see that uh, over 50% of them did not improve over eight years. So it's very important to understand the psychiatric or the anxiety issue along with the headache issue. If you look at the association between migraine and anxiety, you'll see that if you look at migraine with aura, Individuals with panic disorder have a much higher probability, a, a much higher association between migraine and, and, and panic. Um, even without or, there's a three-fold higher association. And you look at the same thing for generalized anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, and, and certain phobias, there's about a three to five increased probability if you have one disorder that you have another disorder. Um, and you'll see a, a variety of studies down the line. So there is an association between migraine and a variety of the anxiety disorders. And this is in the community. This is not only in a, in a clinic setting. This is if you do a, a research study where you're actually calling people on the telephone and asking them um, if they have migraine and actually taking a history of migraine and taking a history of a psychiatric issue. So the two most consistent findings in psychiatric issues in migraine in that 
mood problems like depression and anxiety problems seem to disproportionately affect migraine uh, sufferers. And about 25% of migraine sufferers have depression or some mood disorder, and over 50% have anxiety disorders. So anxiety disorders are much more common. And if you go to a clinic, it's much more prevalent than if you just ask people in the community. And as the disorder, as the headache disorder becomes more frequent, more chronic, psychiatric issues also increase. So these are the different anxiety disorders that we can talk about. There's panic disorder, and you can have panic disorder with or without agoraphobia. And the key in panic disorder is not so much the number of attacks people have, is that if people are fearful of having another attack. So you could only have had a few attacks, but the fear of having an attack dramatically affects your life. Agoraphobia is avoidance of seeing friends, work, a variety of things where basically you become uh, housebound. Generalized anxiety disorder really is worry. It's really a people that are chronic worriers. Obsessive compulsive disorder, a variety of rituals, thoughts, um, obsessions, and actual compulsive rituals that dramatically affect someone's life and they feel like they can't control. Many people have specific phobias. And post-traumatic stress disorder is when somebody has had a life event that is uh, is dramatic, uh, either life-threatening or they feel it's life-threatening, that they continue to have symptoms after the after the event is over. So, for example, they might re-experience the event, they might feel numb, they might have all kind of a variety of um, dissociative phenomena. So if you look at these over, over um, research studies, developmentally what you often see is that, that kids tend to get specific phobias or some form of anxiety early on. And that tends to precede the onset of migraine. And then the onset of major depression seems to follow the onset of migraine. So anxiety might appear in childhood, followed by migraine, then followed by depression, and then followed by chronic migraine. And if people have major depression and migraine, the odds are that they also have some kind of anxiety disorder. So anxiety disorders, even if someone presents with depression, anxiety disorders are very, very common. And the prevalence, of, as I said before, of anxiety in migraine sufferers is higher than depression. And as you get chronic issues, like chronic daily headache, or if you have medication overuse headache, you know, where medication overuse is an issue, people with those problems seem to have higher levels of anxiety as well as mood issues than people who have episodic migraine or less frequent migraine. So when you think of symptoms that are common to most all anxiety disorders, the people have fear worry. They think about it all the time. Their cognitive processes, they're fearful, worrisome, and they tend to have some physical symptoms like muscle tightness, um, jaw clenching, a, a feeling of increased arousal, and they tend to have avoidance behaviors. So they might try to avoid worry in generalized anxiety disorder. They might try to avoid panic in panic disorder. In a specific phobia, they might try to avoid the thing that they're fearful of. But if you think about it, that some people also try to avoid migraine, that, that you know, somebody who's prone to anxiety, if they have an unpredictable, severe event like migraine, they'll show a lot of anxiety, even to a symptom that might not actually be provocative of migraine, an early warning signal that may or may not actually lead to headache. So it's very important to, to look at the physical symptoms of migraine patients as well as people with anxiety, also have a lot of fear of pain or anxiety, as I said before, about migraine. Now, some people actually have what we call an anxious depression. They have anxiety symptoms and mood symptoms. Um, and that it, it makes it harder to, to diagnose. Um, so if you have somebody with lots of worry or panic, as well as depression, it, it's more burdensome. And if you add migraine to that, it's a very difficult group of, of problems. 
many people have social phobias or social anxiety, and that that tends to increase the risk of depression because if someone's fearful of feeling humiliated in some social situation, they become very avoidant, stay at home frequently, and it leads to lower mood and less friends and obviously a much lower activity level. Now we always think that what we think about um, migraine or what we think about anxiety disorders in 2012 is new and we know best, but in 1900, Hermann Oppenheim, he talked about chronic migraine and basically he said um, very similar things to what we say now. They talk about the conversion of migraine attacks into this permanent form has been observed by me, particularly in neurosthenic or hysteric persons. And so he's, he's, he's talking about these people have uh, suffered for a long time, whose parents were troubled with migraine, and this permanent chronic form seems to have some psychiatric issues associated with it. And, and he's talking about this in 1900 in a medical textbook. Now, if you look at um, medication overuse headache, what you seem to have is that the anxiety problems or the mood problems, if you if you look at an episode of major depression, panic disorder, generalized anxiety, social phobia, substance abuse, all seems to precede the problem with medication overuse. So these people seem to, you know, have an issue with anxiety or mood even before they start to overuse a particular medication treating their headaches. And my dear friend, um, who died a few years ago, a wonderful headache person uh, and a, a wonderful man, Fred Sheftel, he, he had this diagram that shows increasing complexity. And so if you have somebody who has major depression or an anxiety disorder and no other psychiatric problems and just episodic migraine, these people tend to be relatively easy to, to treat. You treat anxiety, you treat migraine, and they do usually very well. As you have a second psychiatric problem, we have major depression and panic, it gets a little more complex. And then way at the end, when somebody has long-standing personality problems, depression, anxiety, as well as chronic migraine and medication overuse, those people are become the heart, you know, have a very problematic disorder and become much harder to treat. And it, it's a, it's a much more complex and you have to really be aware of many, many treatment options. So when you think about migraine with anxiety, remember, anxiety, people with anxiety have a lot of fear and they have a lot of thoughts of danger and vulnerability. So, and patients across all anxiety disorders exhibit avoidance behaviors. So when you have somebody with migraine and anxiety, they tend to overestimate the likelihood of the occurrence of a negative event like migraine. And they, and they perceive a situation as more catastrophic, threatening, and unmanageable than the objective reality. So it makes sense. If you have a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry, a lot of fear, a lot of reactivity, and you're about to get a headache, you get more aroused and, and feel that this is more catastrophic than somebody who doesn't have an anxiety problem. So. Many headache patients, and I think this is a really a key point for this, and we're almost done with the slide part of it, but headache patients with anxiety often develop these fear reactions. And remember, if you, if I used to work years ago in a, in a laboratory, and we would, if you studied anxiety in a laboratory, you gave your little laboratory rats unpredictable, severe pain. And um, all those patients, all those patients, all those little rats developed anxiety. And, and, and that's how you, you know, to develop anticipatory fear, and, you, and if you have anxiety, migraine is the perfect uh, anxiety precipitant. It's unpredictable, it's pretty bad, and, it, and you don't know when it's going to happen. And so a lot of people will treat fear with medication. They say, oh my god, I think I'm going to get a migraine, and they'll take something believing that they will preemptively avoid the headache. However, sometimes the medication just is almost, um, it, it, it isn't 
what it's intended to do. It just reduces emotional distress and, pre quote, prevents the migraine, but that's more of avoidance learning than it is actually working the way medication works. So there's a lot of um, conditioned avoidance and a lot of anticipatory fear in people with anxiety and migraine that they feel something and they're at a particular uh, place where they often have migraine or it's a hot sunny day or the weather's changing or and they start to feel a sensation and they develop this almost like oh my god feeling and they believe that they're going to get a migraine and so they might treat it preemptively sometimes inappropriately. There's also growing evidence that many people with episodic migraine and chronic daily headache have histories of some kind of child abuse. Um, and there's also a bunch of literature between migraine and post-traumatic stress disorder. And sadly, we're starting to see that in the military more and more in, in both men and women. So we, we talked about earlier, if people have psychiatric problems, like particular anxiety and migraine, are they, do they do worse in treatment? And we used to think, yes, they do. But there's been a few recent studies that have shown that, you know, with very good diagnostic criteria and some patients with anxiety, some patients with depression, some patients with both, what you see is that before they were treated, the people with the psychiatric problems had more frequent, more disabling headaches and a worse quality of life. However, the rates of improvement in all measures were comparable across the four groups, which is contrary to conventional wisdom. So in reality, what you're saying is people that get treated, and they get treated in particularly effective ways, will do well whether or not they have a psychiatric problem. So it's really important to get adequate treatment. Um, in terms of drug treatment of anxiety disorders, there are the SSRI antidepressants and the SNRI are the mainstream um, of the mainstays of treatment, but they require usually higher doses, uh, interestingly, than when treating depression. And many patients with anxiety have a lot of fear of any change in their physical sensation. So it's sometimes hard to get people up to the right dose. And the best long-term data is on these cognitive treatments, these cognitive behavioral treatments of anxiety. So the way just basically to manage it, anxiety in, in, in headache patients or non-headache patients is exposure. But you want people to safely and gradually expose themselves to feared stimuli, things that they are afraid of. And that's really the hallmark of treatment but it requires a gradual limiting of avoidance. Having people tolerate some distress, talking to themselves in a way that helps them manage it, and then eventually have more and more exposure to things that they're fearful of. The exposure can be external, so if somebody's socially fearful, it, it can be going to someone else's house or to a social event, or it can be internal as in panic, because in panic disorder, people will try to avoid a physical sensation that's internal. It's not external. It's a sensation that they have that they say to themselves as their heart beats a little faster. They say, oh my God, I'm about to have a panic attack. So, and they, it also, we try to modify danger and vulnerability thoughts to more rational alternatives. So people don't, you know, they can rationally gauge the true danger in a situation, which is usually much less than they believe. And so, when we're treating headache patients with a cognitive treatment or a behavioral treatment, one of the things I do a lot of is help people modify the stress-related thoughts and help them believe that their headaches are controllable and that their anxiety is controllable. So you can use similar types of treatment to basically help people rehearse how they respond to the development of a migraine, what they do, and the same way as they respond and, and rehearse how that they behave as a panic attack develops. And you want people to accurately interpret body signals. Is it time to medicate? Is it not? To develop action plans. And um, so, for example, with treating migraine, 
the way people talk to themselves is incredibly important. So to, you, you need someone to write down how are they going to manage that migraine or how are they going to manage, let's say, a panic attack. What happens when it starts? Pause, take a slow breath. What's the plan? One step at a time, let's go through it. As the intensity builds, this is time limited. It's not going to last very long. It's uncomfortable. I know what to do. And they go through critical moments and self-reflection and evaluation and how to, how to change the treatment plan in between attacks. So panic and migraine are fairly similar to manage in a sense of the way you talk yourself through it, not talking yourself out of it, but having a plan that you actually put into effect and practice at a time of tremendous discomfort. So just to conclude, anxiety disorders often coexist with migraine. Anxiety itself might make you more emotional, might make the migraine have more of an impairment and make it sometimes harder to treat, but certainly treatable. And it may contribute to your, your episodic headache disorder becoming chronic or more frequent. And as headache gets more chronic and there's more medication overuse, there's an increased risk of anxiety issues. Any physical or emotional abuse may further be complicating. And is in, most importantly, it's important to treat both migraine and psychiatric conditions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Baskin. Our first question comes from Donna. What is the mechanism that causes a migraine to end? Well, it's a good question. I mean, <laughs> you, sometimes it's just time, Donna, that, you know, there's a, you know, what migraine is, is it's not just a headache. It's, it's something that very slowly often builds. And um, even when it's, it's treated and somebody feels better headache-wise, they often have a post that might last for a, a day or so where they start to feel, you know, they're feeling kind of logy and foggy and, and, and off base. So, you know, there's a, probably a variety of mechanisms. Well, one, it's just basically has a, a amount of time that the whole process goes. And when a medication can keep the, the trigeminal vascular system, you know, the, a, a system of nerves and blood vessels that are part and parcel of, of head pain, to basically um, clear that system so that it's not as activated, so the trigeminal vascular isn't as active, that seems to, to work. And also as the brain centers stop generating um, migraine, that seems to help. And sometimes that's just turned off by sleep or time. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kate. Uh, Kate has a daughter who, is, who was diagnosed with an AVM deep in her brain that was inoperable by resection at 3.6 centimeters. And uh, the risk of a re-bleed they elected for SRS, radio surgery gamma knife. Since the surgery, she's lived with a daily headache for about six months. The MRI shows swelling, and the true evidence is that she is in pain. However, the doctors keep informing them that it's an anxiety headache. She believes her child does suffer from some anxiety and that that's natural. But to discount her wanting relief from pain in the name of anxiety is wrong. Can you... Uh, give any advice on how to prevent her from developing a psychological disorder? Well, there's a couple things. She's had a very complicated physical problem, you know, with uh, a significant amount of, of treatment. It's not uncommon after any kind of neurologic insult, so uh, head trauma of any kind, e either after surgery or be be because of, of any, you know, anything at all to develop chronic headache. So that's not an uncommon phenomena. It's, it's um, yeah, she probably has some anxiety, but as I said before, just because anxiety and psychiatric and uh, headache run together, it doesn't mean that anxiety is a cause of headache. Um, so my my best advice was to have her see, you know, if the acute neurologic problem is is over, you know, to have her see a, a headache specialist who really um, can take a look at the headache problem because it's probably similar to some form of post-traumatic headache. Our next question comes from Sam. 
what about migraineurs who have anxiety specifically about their migraines? What can they do? Well, the, the thing I showed you before, Sam, um, I, I think it's helpful to have a plan that, you know, to, um, you know, know what you're going to do and to get that plan in shape even, be, even be before you have a headache because any kind of intermittent, unpredictable, severe pain is anxiety-inducing just by the nature. You know something bad is about to happen, but you don't know when you're going to have a degree of anxiety. And so what happens if you don't have a plan that's very well practiced, as soon as you start to feel the early warning signals or, of it, or it starts to, if it comes on quickly, you get this oh, oh no reaction, and then your anxiety level really gets high, and then you have a lot of anticipatory anxiety. So to me, the most important thing is to have, develop a degree of control, to know what you're going to do, if it works well, how to implement it, and if it doesn't work well, you know, the, with your doctor to reevaluate your plan. Our next question comes from Katie. How common are daily migraine headaches, and is humidity a common trigger? Well, migraine usually progresses, is able to progress from episodic to migraine. It's, it's not anywhere near as common as episodic migraine. A lot of people in the population will have episodic migraine, but there is more people than you think that develop this chronic variant of migraine. And it can be really problematic because, you know, in order to get a diagnosis of chronic migraine, you have to have 15 or more migraines a month for a significant amount of time. And, and that's very debilitating. And so it is, it is um, common. It progresses, you know, be, because of a variety of reasons. The most common way it progresses is medication overuse. Not substance abuse, but just... As people get more and more headaches, they use more and more medications, and sometimes there's just a few pills a day, many days a week, and pretty soon it progresses to chronic and, and you know, to chronic daily headache. Um, other things might progress it, anxiety might progress it, but weather factors usually are, you know, can be precipitants for acute headache, but are usually not chronic migraine uh, precipitants, but, you know, if it, if it is for you, it's, uh, it's still real. The problem with managing weather is that you can't manage the weather. And so, you know, and you, you know, people start to get very nervous about any change in the weather. Um, short of moving, of changing locations, I would treat it, you know, the way people treat chronic migraine with drug and non-drug treatments and making sure that the acute drugs for migraine aren't overused, and that's a challenge at times. Our next question comes from Margaret. Is this information as pertinent to chronic daily headaches as it is to migraine? Um, well, anxiety disorders are more common as headache frequency increases. So it's very, very pertinent to chronic daily headache. Now, there's a bunch of types of chronic daily headache, but I'm talking about chronic migraine in particular. Um, individuals who have headache, you know, the, the typical chronic migraine sufferer has intermittent migraine and many headaches in between their migraine attacks. So they might have 8 to 10 migraine attacks a month, but then 20 other days a month when they have mild or moderate headache. Um, and people with that um, headache pattern have a higher probability of having an anxiety disorder or a mood disorder than individuals who have less frequent migraine. It doesn't mean that that's the cause of it at all, but they seem to run together, probably because of some new, you know, shared mechanisms that some you know, people with migraine and people with, let's say, chronic an you know, anxiety problems probably have some problem with certain neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, glutamate, a variety of these brain chemicals that seem to be involved in both anxiety as well as migraine. Our next question comes from Laura. Like anyone who has migraines, I am anxious that any little throbbing in my neck is going to turn into a major migraine, and I debate whether I should take something now or later. How can I find out whether or not, other than fearing a migraine if I have an anxious personality? And how do you not worry that minor symptoms are going to turn into a migraine? Well, you hit the, 
that's the the big question in migraine, Lori. You really um, asked a very important question. That as people's, if you have one migraine a month and you treat it early, that's great. I mean, the the thing about migraine is you want to treat it early. However, as the frequency increases, it gets it, it becomes a complicated decision tree because you're not sure if you can take medicine as frequently as you are and is this really going to be a migraine or not and I just took the medicine two days ago, can I take it again? And that's the little dance that everybody does. Um, and yes, anxiety affects that because if you have an anxiety problem and you say, oh my God, this is going to be a migraine, I'm going to miss the whole day and you're you know, you're over predicting, you will probably be taking more and more medication ineffectively and unnecessarily, which then might actually increase your migraine frequency. So it's a real judgment call, and the goal is a, a preventative treatment sometimes to take either a preventative medication or to have a preventative behavioral headache treatment so your frequency gets lower so you can treat earlier. But it's a great question, Laura. Our next question comes from Katie. When you say child abuse, would childhood trauma count? For instance, loss of a parent at a young age? Yeah, that's not really child abuse, but it's certainly a traumatic event in someone's uh, history. So you can have many losses and, you know, anything that increases a sense of vulnerability probably raises the probability of having anxiety and probably if you have a biology for migraine increases the, the chance of having migraine and and so child abuse and emotional abuse are different obviously than early childhood loss but certainly people you know who have early loss have a vulnerability to anxiety issues and probably if they have a biology for migraine to migraine as well our next question is from Laura. With epilepsy, with epilepsy use of Topamax uh, makes an anticonvulsant side effect sickening. What then? Topiramate or Topamax is a, it's an anticonvulsant that's used for epilepsy and it's also used for migraine. The amount that one takes for migraine is usually less than the amount that one takes for epilepsy. And yes, there are some side effects. Usually you have to on that drug for migraine, you have to start it kind of low and bring it up um, slowly. The good news for epilepsy is there's a variety of other anti-epileptic drugs, so if you can't tolerate the pyramid, there's certainly other drugs to take. In migraine, it's a, it's a mainstay, you know, it's, it's used a lot. It's probably one of the better preventative drugs for migraine, and so when we use it for migraine, we usually start people very slow at a low dose and really bring them up very slowly because we want to try to get them up to a pretty good dose, but it's usually pretty well tolerated in migraine. Thank you. Our next question is from Scott. Is there a link between stress and migraine? There is. I mean, the word stress is used in a variety of of ways, typical ways as a, as a stressor, but you know, some people use it as a specific response of their nervous system. Some people use it as something that's un uncontrollable. But yes, that there's been many studies that have shown that that actually um, major stressors and daily minor hassles seem to be linked to an increased frequency of migraine. And it's often it isn't it often doesn't happen at the time of the stress, but often happens after the stress. So. A common thing is you'll see a business person working voraciously at a deadline and going, 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 staying up late, and then finally they get on the airplane to make the presentation, sit back, relax a little bit, fall asleep, and they wake up with a severe headache. So yes, there's a relationship between stress and, and migraine. Our next question comes from Sam. Uh, how can a migraineur change his schema of migraine from medication-centric to a safer, better model of thinking about them? It's a good question, Sam. Um, a lot of patients have a medication-centric model for good reason, just because um, medication is usually it's a, it's a significant disorder and medication is often necessary. I think that what you're saying, Sam, is that I think a coping skills model where you can use 
drug and non-drug treatment is probably by far the best way to to look at it. So how does one prevent, you know, in terms of a coping skill, how does one prevent an attack? Well, learning some basic relaxation exercises, stress management uh, practices, understanding the early warning signals, um, following exercising, you know, at some frequency and having a, a very good regular schedule. There's many of these things that really can dramatically affect headache frequency, um, how you chart your headaches, you know, to be really aware of the frequency, intensity, duration, are there any triggers, without being obsessive about it, you know, but to, to really be an educated consumer, and so you really know your frequency, you know what triggers it. You learn a low arousal response, how to meditate a little bit, how to manage stress a bit, and, you, and then most importantly, I think, that you really have a coping skill of what do you do when you start to get a migraine? What medicines do you use? How do you use it? When do you know if they're not working? Try and something, you know, so you become uh, a um, advocate of yourself with your doctor. And you're also, even if you're using medication, you're using it within a coping skills model. So one of the skills you have is to take certain medications and how you take that medication is actually a skill and you can develop it and and so I, I like to think of managing migraine at, at, as a coping skill that involves non-drug approaches, drug approaches, a lot of lifestyle regulation, exercise, and all a variety of things. Thank you. Our next question comes from Chastity. Is there a connection between neurological activities related to migraine and anxiety? Um, well, the brain is, uh, an, is an amazing organ and generates both, all kinds of things, including migraine and including anxiety. And yes, there are a variety of messengers, chemical messengers in the brain that give information. And people with anxiety disorders probably have some kind of disturbance in that, in a neurotransmitter, which doesn't mean that you need to actually have medication to affect change in it. The same with migraine. There's something in migraine deep in the brain that, that's a migraine generator and it generates an attack and then you get the attack outside the brain in blood vessels and nerves in the brain covering. So in both anxiety and migraine there's probably some kind of central in the brain excitability that is neurochemical in origin but certainly if, if affected by the environment and then migraine ends up in an attack that resides outside the brain, but probably generated inside the brain, the same as anxiety is. Thank you. Our next question is from Rosalie. I'm afraid of the side effects of preventative medication. Can you comment on this? I always have side effects. Well, a lot of people are fearful of side effects. Um, you know, in terms of our topic and anxiety disorder, people with anxiety disorders have an amazing scanning system in their brain. They have the ability to notice any signal that things aren't right, and that's kind of the hallmark of anxiety. So you can, I mean, I have a patient now that has um, obsessive compulsive disorder fairly severely in migraine, and she started on a SSRI, an antidepressant, that's helpful in high amounts, and she's been treated by many, many people over the years. We started her at a dose that was so low that a lot of people thought that it was just, uh, you know, that if she had any side effects, it would be, you know, impossible to have it, you know, but we, I, I know her, and I know that she has many side effects, so it took, instead of taking about four weeks to bring her up to the right dose, it took about nine months. And now she is on a dose that is a pretty high dose, you know, with an, a very, very good effect. But it took probably five times longer than it normally takes, you know, somebody. And people have side effects to these medicines. I mean, they are medications that have a powerful effect on migraine who often have some side effects. So you have to bring them up very slowly, try to tolerate some of them, but some people have a very, very hard time with it. And we're trying to develop newer medicines that work a little differently that might have less side effects. But it is a, it, it's a challenge. Our next question is from Alan. 
I do believe that anxiety plays a large role in my son's chronic daily headaches and migraine. The anxiety is from a mild stutter that he's had since childhood and the anxiety over all the school he has missed and the difficulty in getting back into the academic mainstream. Do you have any su suggestions? He only takes amitriptyline on a daily basis and had, has had Botox. Um, just to clarify, my son, who is a young adult, just said that he has anticipatory anxiety about stuttering much, much more than about getting a migraine. Right. A lot of stutterers have a tremendous amount of anticipatory anxiety, and in particular making a phone call or asking somebody out on a date or anything, you know, where they actually have to prepare for it in, in advance. Um, there's a lot of... Um, treatment programs for stuttering, some effective, some not as effective. I do think in stuttering, getting people in really good physical shape is somewhat helpful in terms of regulating their biological rhythms, getting up the same time, not being overtired, trying to go to bed the same time, watching the amount of alcohol they use, almost any drug that's disinhibiting, you know, so alcohol and um, tranquilizers often increase stuttering. Um, anxiety level in general will increase stuttering. Talking slowly sometimes seems to help. The, there are some stuttering management programs that try to teach people to talk very slowly at first. Um, but it's a little bit of a, you know, it can increase things like social phobia because if you're fearful of being in a situation where you might stutter, you might avoid the situation because of the anticipatory anxiety, as you mentioned. And so it's helpful to work with somebody on both the speech issues as well as the phobic part of it or the anticipatory anxiety part of it. You'll be able to work with someone on speaking and also to encourage somebody to put themselves gradually in situations that there's an increased chance of anticipatory anxiety. Very common problem. Well, Dr. Baskin, I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I do apologize for all the participants whose questions we could not get to, but um, I do think that all the information presented was very helpful, and we hope you join us again in the future. Sure. I enjoyed it. All right. I'd like to remind everyone that we will do one last webinar on December 11th, and it'll be uh, Women in Migraine. And I encourage you to join us for that session as well, and everyone have a great evening.